I'd like to spend a few minutes looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 19 to 23. This is a very important paragraph for it shows us the way the apostle approached sinners with the gospel. I mean, one way of approaching sinners with the gospel is to say we have our theology worked out, we have our technical words, and we set out the gospel message, and I use the word message there in the sense of revelation from God. We set out the revelation from God, the message, in terms of our theology and using all our technical language, and you sinners just have to learn the language and come up to where we are and do your best at trying to cope with our theology. God, in his sovereignty, of course, will enlighten you and bring you into the liberty of Christ when you trust him and turn from your, when you turn from your sins and trust him. Paul certainly did not adopt that method. As he tells the Corinthians, he wants to make the gospel free. For the gospel is free. The grace of God is the free grace of God, the sovereign grace of God. And Paul is determined to make the gospel free, his preaching free, when he approaches sinners. And he uses his mind. He thinks about his hearers. And his number one concern is to communicate with them. I say number one. I mean, he must communicate with his hearers if he's going to bring them to Christ or if God is going to use him uh, to bring them to Christ. Of course, God is sovereign, and I suppose he could use a monkey talking. But Paul knows that God uses means and we have our responsibility. And so he says, I think about my hearers. And I do what I can to communicate with men. This is a very important principle for us today. We must learn how to communicate with the sinners around us without compromising the message, the revelation of God, the gospel. And Paul gives us some key uh, help here, some instruction here. He tells us, he told the Corinthians, how he went about it. What he said, I know that in broad detail, all my hearers are divided into two groups. There are those, he, say, he says, who are under the law, who have the law. And there are those who are not under the law, who don't have the law. Now, whatever is he talking about? Well, we don't have to guess. He tells us. Besides which, the rest of Scripture tells us anyway. But he tells us here, those who have the law are Jews. God gave the law to Israel on Mount Sinai after Israel was rescued from Egypt in the Exodus. The law was given as a special marker for Israel. Psalm 147, Deuteronomy, Romans 9 and so on. It tells us the law was given to Israel and to no other nation. The temple was given to Israel, and no other. The Sabbath was given to Israel, and no other. The law was. And Paul knows that some of his hearers are Jews. They have the law. They know the law. They're under the law. And so he will use the law. He himself will use the law, and go under the law, as it were, to reach them, without compromising the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The other here is the Gentile. The Gentiles, he said, don't have the law. They're not under the law. They don't know the law. It was never given to them. So what do I do when I address them? Well, I become under the law. I become lawless like they are. Not uh, lawless, but lawless. I adapt myself. I don't compromise the message. It's still the gospel. I still preach Christ. But I have to communicate with Jews. And I have to com communicate with Gentiles. And so I realize where they are. When I preach to Jews, 
I'll start with the law, and I'll use the law, the Old Testament, all of it. When I preach to Gentiles, what do I do? Well, let's ask him. Let's look. Acts 14, Acts 17, Romans 1, Romans 2. What does he do? He uses conscience. He uses nature. He uses the responsibility of the Gentile sinner, suppressing the knowledge of God. He uses creation to point to the glory of God. He speaks about their practices, their superstitious ways, their foolishness, and so on and so on. He speaks about climate and the weather. And he appeals to their conscience, Romans chapter 2, 12 to 15, and so on and so on. But when he's with the Jews, it's Abraham, it's, it, it, it's the, the patriarchs, it's the law, it's the prophets. This is the way the apostle goes about his business. To the weak I become weak. To the Jews I use the law. To the Gentiles I appeal to what they know. My aim is to bring them to Christ, that they might be saved. And I know to do that I must communicate with them. And that's how I go about my business. Now, as I say, those lessons are paramount, vital, essential for us to grasp today in our approach to sinners. But I want to speak upon this passage, this paragraph, from the point of view of New Covenant theology, made simple. But it's not made simple, it is simple. You see, according to the Covenant theologians, the Reformed, the lawmen, Paul should never have written this paragraph. They don't believe a word of it. In the essential. What do I mean? They believe that all men are under the law. That all men have the law written in their heart. All men know the law. But Paul divided the world into those who have the law and those who don't. Oh no, say covenant theologians. All men have the law. Adam had it. All the patriarchs had it. The Sabbath is in, the, in Genesis. Genesis 2. Well, God kept the Sabbath, it's true. But it's in Genesis 7 and 8 and throughout there. Oh yes, they were keeping the Sabbath, the patriarchs, and so on and so on. It goes on in that way. All men have the law. And yet Paul says expressly, some do not have the law, whereas the Jews did. Paul was unique here. Why? In this class. Because he was a believer. And all believers are unique in this sense. What do you mean? Well, he was a Jew. Therefore, he was under the law. But he had come to Christ. Therefore, he says, I'm free. I'm free. I'm liberated in Christ. I'm no longer under the law. So, but I do go back under the law when I speak to Jews. But I'm not under that law. What law are you under then, Christ, uh, Paul? Because I am under a law, he says, the law of Christ. But when I go to Gentiles, because they don't have the law, I become lawless, although I am still under the law to Christ. Can you see what he's saying? My point is this. Gentiles are lawless. When you speak about the Mosaic law, they have their own law, the law of conscience, that rudimentary knowledge of right and wrong written in their hearts by God, yes, Romans 2, 12 to 15. But they don't have the law of Moses. The Jews, though, Israel, did have the law of Moses. And this passage makes it abundantly clear. Covenant theologians are talking nonsense here. They're contradicting this passage. This passage says expressly, Gentiles do not have the law, the law of Moses. Jews do have the law, the law of Moses. Therefore, says Paul, I don't use the law of Moses when I address Gentile sinners. Now, how do covenant theologians get round this? Well, you only got to read their works and see. They slip in a couple of words. Oh, all men do have the law, but the Gentiles did not have the rites and ceremonies of the law. They mean the ceremonial law. Well, if you're going to play that kind of trick with Scripture, why bother with the Bible? Why not just write your own Bible? Paul did not say rites and ceremonies, ceremonial. He would never have dreamed of such a thing. Besides which, it wasn't that the Jews had the rites and ceremonies 
and the Gentiles didn't have the rites and ceremonies, but did have the law, really. Oh, it's a nonsense. Paul said the law, and he meant the whole law, the book of the law, the covenant of the law, the whole revelation of the law, from beginning to end. And that's why he used the law when dealing with Jews. And that's why he did not use the law when dealing with Gentile sinners. Of course, when he's dealing with uh, believers, Jew or Gentile, he will use the law as a paradigm. For he himself, as all believers, are under the law of Christ, not the law of Moses. I say this paragraph destroys covenant theology. That all men have the law, the one covenant, from beginning to end, written in their heart. It's a nonsense. It also destroys preparationism. That is, covenant theologians say we must preach the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments they mean, whittling it down to the Ten Commandments. We must preach the law uh, to sinners to bring them to Christ. Paul says expressly here that I do not, when I address Gentile unbelievers, I do not preach the law to them. I preach what? Well, I've told you, conscience, uh, superstition, the light of nature, and all the other things. And of course, supremely, he will preach the two great commands of the gospel to sinners. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. God commands all men everywhere to repent. That's what he said in Acts 17 to the Athenian sinners. What am I saying? This passage destroys covenant theology. The only way covenant theologians can get round this passage is to put glosses like rites and ceremonies in there. But Paul didn't say that. This passage destroys covenant theology. It establishes the truth which we as New Covenant men seek to bring to you. New Covenant theology is simple. The Jews are under the law, or were under the law of Moses. The Gentiles never were under the law of Moses. We preach Christ and Him crucified. Believers are under the law of Christ. They are free from the law of Moses if they were Jews before, and they are now brought into the liberty of the law of Christ. That is what this passage teaches, and it's simple. And that's why I've used it and spoken on it in my series, New Covenant Theology Made Simple. It's not made simple, it is simple, because it's scriptural and apostolic. Covenant theologians should stop their shenanigans with the scriptures. I appeal to you, read the scriptures, read them for themselves, and act upon them. Let the confessions and the catechisms go if they contradict scripture. Scripture shows us plainly the teaching of New Covenant Theology.